Hi there, uh, this is Unveiling the Veil, and my name's Jamie Robaz. And I'm Dave Evans, and we're with uh, Falling Squirrel, and uh, what are we going to talk about? Uh, our audio uh, game, The Veil, Shadow of the Crown. It's a all-audio uh, adventure game, and today we're presenting to talk about ways that you can use audio to strengthen the narrative of an interactive project and why it's valuable, uh, to advocate for the creation of more audio-focused and blind accessible game content, uh, and to give you a behind-the-scenes look at developing The Veil so you can know some of the trials, tribulations, and success that we ran into along the way. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about The Veil Shadow of the Crown. Uh, it's an action adventure game with RPG elements. Uh, it's five plus hours of gameplay. Uh, completionists probably takes you seven plus. Uh, there's also difficulty levels, so if you're playing on really hard, uh, it could actually take you, I think, as much as eight, nine hours. Uh, it's audio-based combat and exploration is the, the, the main uh, aspects of the game. Um, we focused on uh, quality of uh, voice performance um, and we wanted to create an emotional engaging story and it's fully blind accessible. Those are some of the features and uh, we're just going to play a trailer followed by a little section of combat to just to give you some sort of uh, grounding as to what this game is as we talk more about it. And in order to best experience the game, we recommend that you put on a pair of headphones as the game uses binaural audio. Any set of stereo headphones will do, uh, so we'll give you a few seconds to grab those before we hit play here. Perfect. And here we go. Escort the blind girl 500 miles down a treacherous valley in the wake of an invading horde. Not sure what reward would be worth that. Pirates. Coming aboard. The shades were fortunate to gain hold over such a creature. <laughs> Alex, your weapon. It's on fire. I know you can use the damn thing. That swinging girl. <laughs> In the dark, you shine, Alex. Every one of us serves the Fae. Whether we know it or not, I will not serve them. That is why you must die. Adriana told me you were coming. A blind princess, doomed to watch her kingdom burn. If you want the kingdom, you will have to take it from me yourself. One second born to another, it's not an easy thing, being in someone's shadow. I like the shadows. Oh, the clansmen again. Myra, and they're coming this way. Use your fire. It may scare them off. This is as good a time as any to put your new powers to use, Princess. Remember, you need to build favor with the Fey Realm before you can bring the fire. did we make the veil uh yeah the, the veil was uh a started with an idea that i wanted to make an audio based game basically so i could as an indie developer uh tell a bigger story uh, one of the things i was doing in triple a was uh directing voice actors uh and also uh writing narratives so those were the obvious strengths uh that would connect to a game like this yeah, and uh, as we uh, started doing market analysis uh, in pre-production, we realized that there were a number of similar games uh, that were uh, all audio or audio based that were really popular with the blind and low vision community, uh, and that there was a large demand for uh, a high quality game that was well made and well developed. Uh, and also we felt that if we made a game that was uh, well made enough, that that novelty would extend past the blind and low vision community and be uh, 
uh, of interest to a mainstream sighted audience as well. Yeah, and binaural audio uh, plugins were readily available at the time we started looking into this game uh, because of VR. So we got, got to take advantage of some uh, cool new technology. And uh, as we were uh, doing our pre-production uh, and our early play tests, uh, initially we started working with uh, Martin Corcellus as our uh, consultant for the blind and low vision community. Uh, and we quickly started working with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind as well. Uh, and we immediately found that everybody that we worked with uh, was very engaging, passionate, uh, welcoming, uh, and that there are a diverse uh, amount of people either with uh, uh, different um, uh, accessibility issues uh, or uh, different perspectives on what they wanted in a game. And uh, we were able to, I guess, classify a few different types of players when testing in the blind low vision community. So first off, there were uh, completely beginner uh, players, people who didn't even consider video games as a relevant medium to them uh, because of the accessibility barrier. Uh, these players had a lot of issues uh, with input devices, whether it was keyboard or a controller. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure, uh, uh, especially when we were using a controller, that uh, the way that people we were playing the game uh, was accessible. We found that using uh, the uh, triggers and bumpers and sticks were a lot easier to engage with than face buttons uh, when you have no visual awareness of your controller. Uh, so uh, it was really good to get that perspective. Uh, for intermediate players, these would be people who uh, had a lot of experience playing audio games uh, and were pretty passionate and well-versed in the types uh, of audio games and the mechanics that were used there. Uh, these people were able to give us uh, a lot of variety in terms of what they expected based on what already existed uh, in the market and so far. And then we had our hardcore players. These are our, easily our most demanding players uh, in the blind low vision community, people who had played everything that that was available that was accessible uh, had really really strong opinions about how hard they wanted the game to be and they wanted it to be very hard uh, ha and challenged uh, our idea of um, you know what our game mechanics were going to be in comparison to what mechanics already existed in so far and we uh, kept coming back to the, this community or these communities over and over again to make sure we were meeting all all the different types of players, uh, not only in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of just making uh, an enjoyable experience and one that was equitable both uh, to uh, the mainstream game community and blind and low vision players. Uh, while we were demoing our game, uh, we also ran into some unexpected issues that we would have to tackle. Uh, if your game has no visuals um, and uh, there's a lot of background noise in your venue, it's hard to attract people to it. Uh, it's also really difficult when somebody's standing there playing your game with no visuals to tell what uh, the player is doing and to be able to get feedback from them. Uh, what we ended up doing uh, is um, we would have an audio splitter and we would have a separate set of headphones so we could listen in on somebody playing the game. Uh, and we also came uh, prepared with a lot of pre-test and post-testing questions to make sure we weren't interrupting uh, anybody's engagement with with the game. Uh, because if players, uh, uh, you know, are have... Um, are fully invested in the game from an auditory standpoint and can't see you uh, uh, next to them while they're playing, uh, it can be pretty jarring to interrupt them from that experience. Um, when we were testing online, there were some technical issues that we had with screen readers uh, and we needed to make sure people were either disabling or tuning their screen reader settings to work with the game. Uh, and same thing with some of the development tools that we were using, whether that was additional menus uh, that were for internal use. We want, would want to make sure the next time that we do uh, a project like this to be to develop those tools to be accessible from the ground up. Yeah, and one really cool thing uh, that we got to learn about was uh, we, we do have uh, several um, actors from the vision impaired community that provided voice work for the game. And we got to learn a little bit how to, to uh, record with them. Um, there's a few different techniques, but the one that um, we were introduced to was actors uh, uh, recording audio 
to direct playback in their ears. So they were listening to robot voice playback of the lines I'd written. Um, and they were saying the lines back pretty much as they're hearing them. Uh, we had to, of course, be careful for having some audio bleed between the headset and their voice. And we had to make sure that we uh, had the robot voice stuff set up. So there's a couple of things that uh, we were kind of instructed on how to, how to work. But uh, the one thing, uh, the end result speaks for itself. They did a fantastic job. And I was actually quite amazed, actually, that uh, you could have a full realized performance while being fed lines in your ear. Um, so it was, a, it was definitely a new experience for me. So from a production standpoint, making a game with no visuals is obviously very cost effective. Uh, without that whole pipeline of visual production, uh, you're able to cut down uh, on just about uh, every aspect of game development. Uh, also, um, we were able to quickly prototype scenes and narrative and parts of the game by using uh, Google text-to-speech. Um, that made uh, uh, workshopping different aspects a lot easier. Uh, in terms of uh, making a game that's accessible for the blind and low vision community, uh, there's a really high floor for sales for the game. We knew almost right off the bat that uh, uh, everybody who is already uh, interested in audio games was going to get our game uh, because there's such a high amount of demand and small amount of supply for other projects like this. Um, additionally, the uh, PR was really great. Uh, we had a bunch of content creators, uh, uh, game journalists, uh, shows, etc. reach out to us uh, and uh, get have their interest in our title. Um, and on the other side of that, uh, the blind low vision community from a, a number of different places, whether that was the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, uh, audiogames.net, uh, several different people that we've worked with independently, were all really welcoming uh, and were all really uh, engaging. Uh, people would seek us out to, to help us. People really uh, seemed to appreciate that we were making this kind of game and that we all parties involved wanted to make it as uh, good as it could be um, oh and the game's uh novelty uh was was a big driver so uh there were there were people that came to us that had no real uh interest in talking about our game from the story of accessibility uh they just had never heard of a game like this before and even though it's there's quite a few games like this in the blind community, maybe not the scale we're doing this. Uh, this was still a novelty for a lot of gamers and uh, people who write about games. Um, so what creators love about this game? Uh, I mean, across the board, uh, a huge amount of creative freedom um, in the ability to uh, create a world that's really big and expansive and it's not, again, crazy expensive, but you can also make changes very easily. Um, so uh, the best example would be if I wanted to add a character uh, fairly late in the game, that's uh, a, a, a new dialogue I have to write, uh, and then uh, casting. Um, that's pretty much all that involves. Uh, we don't have to suddenly then model a character at the last minute. S same thing goes for uh, settings uh, and, and adding branches to the story. Uh, we could do those things relatively easily as we kind of uh, uh, created the game and got feedback from the community and also uh, took characters in different directions based on performances from our actors. So uh, normally you're kind of locked in because you've already made all those decisions. So I thought that was a huge, uh, awesome benefit of making a game in all audio. Uh, and the other thing, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later too, is uh, combat and, and certain emergent events could happen kind of anywhere because there was no need for a specific transition um, because you can't see what's happening. You could very easily have a fight just happen in the middle of a blacksmith shop or while you're getting a quest, um, some crazy event could happen. Um, and we, we exploited those things uh, uh, throughout the game. Um, and lastly, uh, the game's incredibly immersive. Uh, and part of that comes from the fact that there's very few things that can take you out of the experience. So if I have a character that's standing right in front of me because the audio spatialization tells me they're standing in front of me and they're whispering my ear and moving around me, if I were to do that in VR or to do that in a, 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 even a AAA experience, um, I'm gonna have a model right here this close to my face and I'm gonna be able to scrutinize the facial effects and the, the quality of the hair and, and, and textures and that sort of thing. And in this game, because I have my eyes closed, which is the way I play it, uh, it it's, it's completely believable just with a, um, with a compelling actor involved.
Yeah, and one of the things that I think we heard a lot uh, is that if you're an audio designer, this is basically a, a dream project uh, for you to run with. Yeah, because you know people are actually going to listen to your work for, for sure. <laughs> so uh, when making the veil, uh, one of the pillars that uh, we had for our design philosophy was to make this as accessible as we could to as broad of a range of players. And as we touched on earlier, there are a lot of different types of players with varying levels of experience. So we wanted to make sure that explorable areas were all simple, that people weren't going to get stuck or be confused as to where they were, uh, even without any visuals. Uh, so that meant that we would make sure that uh, objects that don't have sound are never interfering uh, with objects or directives that do have sound. Um, for explorable locations, uh, we had clear beacons that were very unique, noticeable uh, audio cues uh, that pointed to points of interest. Um, and this way we were able to create things that had a shallow learning curve, whether that was in exploration or in combat, that still allowed a lot of depth for expert players. So not only was uh, uh, our difficulty um, did we use different difficulty settings to be able to make combat have a smaller or larger margin of error? But even in exploration, if you're listening carefully, there are some things that you could pick up on that were optional explorable locations, interactions with characters, or inventory items uh, that people who really listened would be able to hear and take advantage of. Um, we have a small video here we're going to play uh, that just shows you the difference between the in-game perspective on the right and the in-editor perspective on the left of exploring a town so you can get that kind of behind-the-scenes perspective. So you can see on the left, uh, the green squares are those audio beacons uh, in the circle with the cameras the player moving. Here we are, the wandering goat. I'll assume it's an inn and not a stable. Um, so uh, the novelty of the game um, is ultimately its intimate feel. I kind of touched on this, uh, but uh, so, so places where this is um, really important um, in making the game not only novel but f feel great and sort of exp sort of justify why an all audio game might be a superior experience in some way. Uh, the close combat uh, was something that uh, was talked about by people who play the game as being pretty impressive. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, in combat, the subtle things matter, so the shifting of an enemy's weight or their footsteps on the ground and even what kind of ground they're walking on suddenly suddenly matters. Um, most of the combat is very close. It's part of the reason why we chose a, a medieval setting for our game, was that we'd have people wearing noisy equipment, plate mail, and that sort of thing. The players are also uh, awarded uh, or rewarded for listening to details in the soundscape. Um, so again, we didn't want general navigation to be frustrating because you wanted to get to, let's say, the blacksmith. So that's a very easy beacon to hear. Uh, but you might hear the whimpering of a dog in the corner. And if you sort of went over to explore what that is, you could feed him and he could become your companion in the game. So there's little details like that throughout the game that would reward you. Uh, and finally, uh, we could take um, things like uh, shops and tutorials and maps, these things that are often kind of systemized um, and uh, or in the case of, let's say, um, inventory or shop, they become like a, a, just a menu screen with a bunch of um, uh, text on it. Uh, we were able to take moments like that and because we were forced to work in audio and couldn't use any of those conventional um, sort of shorthand things like text, uh, we were able to make those into more narrative moments. So a uh, narrative moment could happen in the blacksmith shop. It feels more like you're bartering with someone or talking to them uh, rather than choosing a weapon. Uh, or in the case of uh, uh, selecting quests, uh, it feels like you're kind of talking to people uh, in a tavern and where, again, anything could happen. A fight could break out or something while you're simply getting a quest. Yeah, that was probably one of the most interesting and challenging parts of development is we wanted to cater towards making a game that felt 
like an equitable RPG or adventure game experience where you had the agency to make different choices that affected the gameplay uh, while also still maintaining that sense of immersion. We never wanted people to go through a series of menus with different stats, though we did include stats in our menus that you can optionally see. Uh, we still wanted to maintain that narrative flow. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> how did we succeed in this? Actually, we, we succeeded in a lot of ways, which is great. Uh, the game came out to uh, re re um, not renounding. What's the I'm making resounding? up words? Resounding. That's, that's the, the word. A resounding critical success, um, and uh, the community reception with the blind community was was uh, uh, very very positive. Um, uh, some of the things that uh, people talked about in terms of what they loved about the game, uh, the audio design um, was uh, lauded. The music was lauded. Um, the uh, quality of the performances across the board uh, were really well received. Um, and uh, the, actually, I was a little surprised that the, the combat challenge and the amount, the fact that the amount of diversity in combat that we had from the beginning to end of the game uh, carried the experience, which is five to seven hours. Uh, that was generally, we, we pulled that off. And I was that was probably my biggest concern going into this was that uh, because there was a certain amount of repetition and things you're doing. Uh, but I think we changed up the scenarios enough that it ended up uh, feeling like it was different, quite different at the end than it was in the middle and the beginning. Uh, and then uh, the narrative uh, in general was really well received. And one thing I, I want to call it in particular was that uh, we were warned uh, going into this by members of the blind community that uh, a sighted developer making a game in all audio uh, that features a blind protagonist who is exceptionally good at things, uh, there's a, a huge trope uh, in doing that. Um, people within the blind community uh, just like anyone playing a video game wants to be transported into a different experience and to be then transported into the same experience every time you play an audio game, which is another blind character, is a trope. And the one thing uh, that uh, we strive for is that this character, uh, the one one major warning, we were told, yes, absolutely do this, that's, that's fine, uh, but make sure this character isn't uh, identified by or defined by their disability, that there are many other things going on. And very early on in the game, there were two things we wanted to do and I think we succeeded at. Uh, one was that you would forget about Alex's blindness very quickly and you'd be playing a character that was, again, not defined by her blindness. You became very comfortable with being her and closing your eyes and living in that experience. And the other thing was that I wanted her blindness to a certain extent, especially early on, to be an element of empowerment. Um, that it's just, uh, and, and really playing a game from a sighted person's perspective, um, being transported into an experience where you get to be um, elevated in some way. And uh, the fact that Alex moves around uh, spaces, big, huge, busy spaces, confidently, she doesn't bump into things. Uh, she is never, we're never reminded of her blindness because again, she's so confident in her movement. Um, this is the way m many people in the blind community live day to day. And that was something uh, that a, a lot of sighted people um, playing the game appreciated. And then again, because you're not forced to be re reminded of this constantly throughout the game and that she does evolve as a unique character, people from the blind community uh, were playing something different and challenging and new and it wasn't just the same trope over again. So I think we got that fairly well. Yeah, in addition to achieving that balance uh, with the narrative and the tropes, uh, there was uh, a difference, I think, in expectations and reception between uh, a general audience and the blind and low vision community. So, uh, you know, there would be critics or players who would play the game and review it uh, and really appreciate it for the novelty. Uh, and we're really happy that uh, uh, we succeeded on that. That front. On the other hand, uh, there are a, a lot of people in the blind low vision community who were very experienced with audio games who were wary of uh, the mechanics in the veil being uh, um, you know, very similar, uh, if not the same as other games. Uh, like we said earlier, a lot of people called it, a, a, you know, a whack-a-mole combat mechanic. Um, and uh, what we found is that even people who had those concerns still appreciated the way that we were able to uh, change up the formula. And Dave touched on it earlier uh, with the challenge and diversity in combat. By having uh, the player have agency through their ability to select 
different types of weapons uh, to use or spec into uh, the different magic attacks that we have. Emergent moments like being pulled underwater or riding a horse and fighting from horseback um, or falling through a hole suddenly. Um, All these moments, sort of the sum of their parts, made each individual thing fairly unique, even though uh, we were coming back to this relatively straightforward mechanic of listening for things and striking out at them. Yeah, when you combine it with the the great quality of the writing and the performances and the, the sound design, some of the parts is, is a really good way to describe it. And we're really happy that everything could come together to be received so well by uh, a bunch of different players. Um, Even though that is the case, there are still some things that we haven't quite figured out and some challenges that we have along the way. Probably the number one thing is uh, marketing and how to sell a game with no visuals. Um, When creating a a trailer um, for the game, uh, there were a lot of comments that we found where um, people were not clear uh, as to what the gameplay was. Um, I think it was for... uh, um, uh, a Xbox uh, live stream event that we had where uh, a lot of the chat was remarking that we were showing our game but we weren't actually showing the game um, and in order to address that uh, we have found that you know having a really clear upfront description saying this is an all audio game there are no visuals um, is is a good way to do that but even for some people they'll skip right by that and just watch it and still be confused. So we've considered adding to the title of videos on YouTube or other places uh, that the game has no visuals and that might make it more to the point for people who are going to skip. And for streaming, we always have to have something on the corner of the screen saying what this game is, wear headphones. Um, Again, because it is very confusing when you see a game that's basically a black screen. Uh, with some small particles. Yeah, on. for streaming and content creators as well, uh, we still don't necessarily have the answers the best way to make it an engaging experience. With games that have a lot of visuals, it's easy to let the visuals kind of take the wheel while a streamer interacts with their yeah. audience. And, and the streamer can show their personality constantly by that interaction. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, in our game, they're just constantly stepping on the only thing that communicates as to what this game is. So you find yourself streaming. When we stream it, we're quiet. We have to be quiet a lot. Um, you know, the one joke I was going to set up on my stream is uh, just have a, a, a just a banner that says uh, this is this this is not a sleeping developer. This is someone playing an all audio game because basically that's what I look like. I close my eyes and I play this game. Um, so I, we don't have a great answer for that. But if you have a great answer, yeah. we're happy to talk to you in Discord about it. Yeah. And then um, just through people playing the game, things that we either we knew we couldn't do because we couldn't afford to do it at the times. But um, we we did not. The game was not set up. The game was set up in 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 a way to be uh, played without interruption. So we didn't have any mechanics to allow us to skip scenes uh, or dialogue. And um, by the way, this was something that wasn't as in, apparent as a problem to me initially. I, I knew it was something we might be able to add later. Um, but what I hadn't considered, maybe stupidly, is that uh, people within the visual visually impaired community would play this game a lot. So I, I really did make this game to be something that was played once or maybe twice on a higher difficulty level because it's it's so narrative-based um, that once you understand all the things that happen, there's less value to coming back to it. Uh, but people who don't have a ton of content to play are playing this game eight times. And at that point, it starts wearing thin <laughs> to hear the same dialogue over and over again. So uh, that's something we're looking into doing, but not something out of the gate we considered. Um, and uh, I guess you might want to talk about the other ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, just in terms of the depth of mechanics, um, you know, we would love to be able to make uh, gameplay additions. Uh, a, a number of people have requested sort of an endless combat mode or an arena mode, um, having more gear yeah. uh, and having more uh, narrative choices that, uh, as we touched upon earlier, I believe, um, you know, we started out with the Alex, uh, the main character, as kind of an empty shell, and you could make choices that would uh, have some effect on the narrative, and we dialed that back a little bit. So for another project, it might be neat to uh, have a a bigger scope of narrative choice. And replayability is even more important within this community because of the lack of content. Um, And then finally, uh, we knew this was going to be the case, but the game's not... um, 
accessible to the hearing impaired community. Uh, we realize there are things we could do to for people that have uh, certain aspects of hearing impairment, uh, maybe like more hearing in one ear or the other. There's certain things we could have added or probably still will add to the game to make that uh, easier because it is an audio experience that some, that many people in a hard of hearing community could potentially experience. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, outside of, um, I guess the other thing would be languages as well. Um, yep. we, and we, subtitles. Yeah, because the first thought in my mind was like, well, we can't afford to do more than English in terms of the uh, the performance, at the acting and voiceover. Um, but there was an argument to be made to say, oh, there's people in other countries that know enough English to be able to play the game, but may want to much better understand what the story is saying, and we could have done subtitling. So th those are kind of, I'd say, borderline missteps to things that we kind of knew wouldn't be there for this game, because our focus was uh, uh, really English-speaking, um, uh, visually impaired community, what was the focus of this game. And going forward in the future, um, we'd love to be able to make uh, um, either blind accessible modes or mods for pre-existing games um, and, uh, you know, porting of audio content podcasts uh, and audio or narrative heavy games to accessible interactive platforms would be really neat. Uh, for future titles, uh, I think one of the things that came up most in playtesting is uh, having some kind of player versus player game that uh, either is uh, devoid of visuals or has an equitable play experience for both sighted players that as a fully uh, visualized game uh, and people who are blind or low vision or choose to play without visuals playing in the same game experience against each other. Yeah. That would be, that would really be super neat. Yeah, I think from an immersion standpoint, I would love to make a game where you could play as a blind character and the visuals would be taken away from you. Um, <clears throat> but you could also uh, play as a sighted character and have those. And you could also be blind and play as a sighted character because the, the sighted character scenario would be 100% accessible. Yeah. Um, and then people in all communities, blind, low vision, hearing impaired, um, could, could all be playing this game together, which is sort of the ultimate goal when it comes to accessibility, that people can share these experiences and they're not limited to just one community to be able to share that, share that experience with. Right, and those experiences would have more dynamic combat options, uh, a depth of mechanics, and the visuals would be equitable regardless of, of your uh, personal accessibility experience. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of people, uh, when hearing about the game, uh, touched on smart speaker games. Uh, and while it's something that we haven't really talked about much recently, it's still uh, a conversation topic that comes up a lot that we would love to touch yeah. upon. And, in the and beyond our company, the, the main thing I think about is, is all these uh, AAA games that have a huge amount of accessible content for the blind community. They have you know, millions of dollars are going into the music, to the writing. Um, and to the dialogue recording um, and uh, hopefully finding ways to deliver more of that content to people because that's ultimately what people they want to be playing the biggest titles um, I, I obviously have gotten some great feedback on on people playing a title that's broken a bit into the mainstream at the same time is for the blind community um, but they also want to be playing the witcher they want to be playing call of duty um, and and that's where i'm hoping this is going uh eventually yeah hey believe oh, that's it uh if you have any questions we're definitely hanging out in the discord so feel free to drop us a line and we'll be happy to chat with you uh, otherwise thanks very much yeah. for uh attending ga conference and yeah. uh, have a good day thank you